Okay, now, change gear. The genetic revolution has the power to change who you are, not just what you do. Did you know that your genetic code will work in a monkey? And your, <laughs> yours works in a centipede. <laughs> Did you know that you are 86% the same as an earthworm? And you are 93% the same as an orangutan? <laughs> That's okay. Did you know that cucumber genes will work inside your brain perfectly? And did you know that all of your genetic code is written in the same language? Microsoft Basic. <laughs> and this is the miracle of life. You don't remember anything other than uh, just, just one thing. You remember something very important. The miracle of life is that every organism on the whole world is written in the same code. And 85% of all the genetic code inside every living creature, including every bacterium, every fungi, every yeast, is the same as in your body. And we can cut and paste whatever we like, one slice of your genetic code into a cucumber, and then add both of those bits into an oak tree, and they'll work fine. Now, although you're laughing, that gives us the most staggering power, because we can cut and paste this genetic stuff, just like Microsoft Word. So we can create insects with two wings. Well, they have two wings anyway, but we can put extra pairs of eyes on those wings. Let's look at some other things we can do. If we go back to the slides. You know, the first 150-year-old human being may already be alive. I think that's quite likely. Think about it. What that means is that by the year 2154, we may be celebrating someone's 150th birthday. Believable? 2,154? Yes, it is believable. And actually, it could have happened as a result of someone who was born uh, today. Now, this is how we are at the moment. Uh, 18 years to adulthood. Actually, I don't think it is, really. I think it's about 35. I've got an 18-year-old. <laughs> you know, you know uh, who here has got a 25-year-old and they're still like boomerangs? They go and they come. <laughs> You know, we're still funding education in a 33-year-old going through his fourth degree. And still I haven't got married or had children yet. Why? Because adolescence is going on to the early 30s, isn't it? Have you noticed? Right. Now, it's a strange thing, isn't it? So we're extending what was happening. Very interesting. We're extending uh, childhood and adolescence right into what used to be adulthood. It's certainly into the 30s. By that, I mean adulthood, if you define adulthood as the acceptance of responsibility in a settled environment with long-term commitments to family and the future, I know that's only one very narrow definition, but if we were to take that, then we would say that 18 years doesn't do it anymore, right? Okay. Now, here's another trend, too. These 50, the 60-year-olds are now wanting to retire at 50, so we've got, we got influences in our society who are giving out an image that basically... It's okay not to settle down until you're 35. And another group of influences in our society are saying, well, I'm expected to retire when I'm 50. So we've got a period of sort of working adulthood, which is being redefined in our society as a 15-year window. <laughs> now, actually, it's unsustainable, isn't it? Let's have a look here. Uh, back to the slide again. I want to know uh, who here feels biologically younger than you, than you think your parents were at the same age. Put your hands up. Okay, have a look now. Right. Who here thinks you're biologically a decade younger than your parents were at the same age? Put your hands up now. Have a look around. Well, ooh, my goodness, me. Who thinks you are, you know, you think of your grandmother at the same age that you were now, or your grandfather? Well, perhaps you say, well, I want anyway. Who thinks you're more than 15 years younger biologically than your grandparents were at the same age? Put your hands up. Mm hmm Okay, let's look at the next slide. Okay. Now, actually, I've redefined age. You see, uh, it's well, if we say youth, let's extend it from 18 to 20. That's very conservative. We could say it's 30 years old, right? And we'll say that the first lifers, the phase of life is a 40-year period from 20 to, 40, 20 to 60. And the second life of period is from 60 to 100. You look at me a little strangely there. And we call the seniors those who are over 100. <laughs> now, although you're laughing, I happen to think 
that life begins at 60. I'm sorry, that <laughs> you can't quite read that. But you could argue that life begins at 60, or it will do very soon. Now, this has very profound implications for AARP. Let me explain some of the reasons why I'm thinking about these things. By the way, you can redefine these ages. Let's go back to the slide again. You, we could push the youth up to 30. We could bring down the second lifers to 90. And we say, well, it's at three, three 30 year periods. The first life is uh, 30 to 60. Second life is 60 to 90. Um, you know, the extraordinary thing is most of you here will live till you're 90. Or not quite, but you have a really good chance of getting there. I'll tell you why. The life expectancy of people who are well educated in America, who are, who are passionate, who are, um, who, have, have a, who are reasonably affluent, have a reasonable standard of living, which would be most of you here, in fact the vast majority of you, in fact all of you, that your life expectancy is higher than the average American. The average American life expectancy now is what, 83, 84, 85? And it's growing. Did you know that every, I must spin on, did you know that every, every four years, the Japanese government tears up the forecasts for how long Japanese women will live. And they add another 12 months. Every four years, the Japanese government realizes they're wrong again. We live in extraordinary times. I'll just go back to these genetics again. Uh, we can combine any animal with anything we like. Uh, we've made a million transgenics, in fact, in the last uh, three years, just in the UK alone, just in Britain. That's a monkey mixed with a goat, a chimpanzee with a pig, a human being uh, with a fish. Yes, they grow to four times their normal length in 12 months. A spider's web gene mixed in with a goat. That produces a spider's web, by the way, in the milk of the goat. You just milk, just milk the goat, collect the web, and spin it out, and you get a new bulletproof jacket. Now, for those who are hair follically challenged, I have good news for you. Using stem cell technology and other things, it looks like we're going to be able to grow new heads of hair quite easily. And we'll certainly be able to grow new teeth. We're already doing it. Uh, you just take a, a small uh, bud of cells, and uh, you can grow them actually in the mouth. That's uh, being done now in various mammals. Um, or you can grow them in the abdominal cavity of another mammal. Um, who here knows someone who has macular gener degeneration? Okay, macular degeneration affects 10 million Americans. And in fact, American citizens say they fear going blind more than anything else. But you know, macular degeneration is going to be a curable disease, a treatable disease. I was talking to someone uh, at, um, at Harvard Medical School recently. Uh, he believes that uh, he has a treatment which is going to be effective. I'll just go back to that slide, actually. He believes that... Um, He's already restoring sight in animals. He takes stem cells from the animals. He injects those stem cells into the retina, adult stem cells, not from some embryo, from adults. And these stem cells regenerate the retina. He is going to start clinical trials in less than five years. And he believes that it will be a two-hour treatment as an outpatient, as a fairly routine therapy for people with macular degeneration within 10 years. It is absolutely astonishing. My first training, as I said, as a physician before I got into writing and futuring and other things like that. But I'm still very involved in medicine, and I've been tracking these things. I have to tell you that the things I'm talking about now are utterly astounding. It's is stuff that would have been science fiction even four years ago. There was another research paper just in the last week showing clearly that you, another miracle. You know, uh, suppose, suppose you, was, you were to have a heart attack. Uh, sorry, what's your name? Tom. Tom. Suppose Tom... Uh, heaven forbid, but suppose you were to have a heart attack, okay? We know now that if we were to take bone marrow cells from, from your bone, take a sample of your bone marrow, and we inject that bone marrow either into your vein or it directly into the heart, that it is very likely that we will see an improvement in your clinical function of that heart. The extraordinary thing is that these bone marrow cells, bone for heaven's sake, bone marrow cells will find their way around uh, your body. They will be looking all the time for heart muscle that's been damaged. And if they find any, they will move into that damaged area of the heart and they will help that heart make a perfect repair. I think that is absolutely incredible, don't you?